So, what is a business number one priority? Who wants to answer? Money. Okay. Second? Third? More money. Money for everyone. So, yeah, make, make profits. Make customers happy. Hmm? Okay, in a common uh, in a common scenario, we are used to think of uh, employees or individuals as um, as the means through which a company makes profits or makes the customers happy. Kind of an of an expendable resource. But what if we inverted this idea and would put individuals first and think of businesses as the means through which um, employees could make profits and could make the customers happy? And not only the customers, but the business and themselves too. It is the business that means. So good afternoon. Thanks for being here. My name is Gabriele Bartolini, and uh, it is a great pleasure to have Dragos Dumitriu with me, the Lean and Kanban champion with us today. And we will be uh, un speaking, and I will try to unearth how um, this simple mind shift allowed Second Quadrant Italy to grow through the adoption of Lean, DevOps, and Kanban. So I would like to uh, give a big applause oh. to Dragos. <laughs> it, it is an honor for, for us to have him here. Well, thank you, but I want to say it's not necessarily uh, Lean, Kanban, and DevOps. They don't grow up uh, and you can buy it from the, the, gar from the market. Uh, it is the people at the second quadrant that have achieved the result that Gabriele is going to show you. Thank you. So if you want to tweet, here are some hashtags and our accounts that you can use to talk about this presentation. So let's start. Uh, in 2010, Vinet um, Nayad, the CEO of HLC, HCL Technologies, wrote this book called Employees First, and customers second. Hang on, but haven't we always been told to put customers first and employees second? Or isn't the customers, customer always right? I think this is a common uh, idea that you have been pushed from the top for, for forever, I think. At least I've been told like this for, for years. But if you haven't read that book, I, I strongly advise that you watch this 20 minute video. It's an inspiring 20 minute video, video of a TED, TEDx conference that he took last year in May in Aix-en-Provence. In, in the video, I quote, he said, managers are there to enable employees to create unique experiences with our customers. So that's the role of a manager, to enable people, according to him. But he's not alone. You might, you probably know Richard Branson, the founder of uh, Virgin. He recently said, put your staff first, customer second, and shareholder third. According to him, and according to people that believe in this, if your customers, if your employees are happy, they are motivated, they are engaged, and they are proud to be part of, a, of your company, they will do their best to make your company shine and succeed. So how, by making the right decisions in personalized experiences, and, and unique experiences with your customers. 
and everyone will benefit from this, the employees, the company, and the customer. So who wants to be happy at work? Well, who doesn't? Eh? Everyone wants to be happy. You don't. Okay, <laughs> so but that's in Germany. Okay, so this is this is the monument. I don't know if you if you know this. Have you ever seen this monument? I I think nobody has seen that but me, <laughs> because that's a monument in Melbourne, Australia, and it's not a famous uh, famous monument, but it's it's called the Aid eight-hour-day monument. It was erected in 1856 in, in Melbourne by the, by the Union to force the government to limit the number of work hours to eight. They said, we need eight hours to work, eight hours to rest, and eight hours for recreation and education. So. And if you think about that, even eight hours is a long time. Eight hours, uh, it's one third of our days, one third of our life, and the best part of our life. So why shouldn't we be happy? So we should, you know, we should make the most out of it. And uh, yeah, after all, you know, we are human beings, beings. we are born to create born to be, to have initiative, and um, also we would like to find fulfillment in what we do in our daily work. So, what do you think, Drago? Well, I think that despite uh, working about eight hours a day, we also sleep about eight hours a day, which uh, leaves us with very little in between. <laughs> Um, and uh, if you add commute time, if you add travel time, if you are a consultant, you're on the road a lot, you realize that you spend a whole lot more time, almost twice as much time with people at work than you, sp than you spend with your family. And um, that, you know, if you spend that much time at work and you're unhappy, the, those consequences will reflect in the quality of what you do and um, in the profitability of the company. So that's what these other leaders realized. And also, there are different management styles. And uh, these management styles, they come from different uh, periods in time, actually. If, uh, if we look at previous centuries, and if we look at the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Industrial Revolution um, was characterized by what? A lot of repeatable work, right? A lot of routine work, a lot of mass production. What has happened in the past century, and even more in this century, we started to have knowledge work and creative work to replace the industrial work a lot, where a lot of the industrial work has been automatized, right? Um, we create software, we create services, uh, maybe, you know, we write books, maybe. Um, a lot of the services provided today are, are invisible. They're not produced in a factory on a line. If we come to visit you anywhere you work, or if you come and visit us where we work, you will see people and you will see laptops. You will not see prime materials anywhere, right? There's a consequence. The work we do is most of, mostly invisible while we are creating that work. And some of the leadership uh, and management styles that have been developed in the past, especially command and control, were based on extrinsic motivation, more like a carrot and stick, right? You make so many things for me, I pay you so much money. You make more, I'll pay you more versus the intrinsic motivators which characterize distributed leadership. Right? Well, what is intrinsic motivation? Let's think of Linux. How did it develop? Right? To what degree did Linux evolve? And how many people were paid to create it? Very few, probably nobody. I don't know, I don't have the numbers, but open source community or in the open source community, you probably know this a lot more, right? There was a lot of development that people did it to take pride in what they did, right? They wanted to provide solutions to the customers, they wanted to provide solutions that were otherwise unavailable to them. And it took some time, but finally they were recognized. Um, 
So decades of research have shown that uh, knowledge, creative workers need high levels of autonomy and empowerment in order to achieve these results. The amount of money will not matter to them. Purpose is more important. Purpose, recognition, and satisfaction. Right? Distributed leadership is characterized by decision-making being shared across a team. And Ed Sheen, one of the um, experts worldwide, wrote over 100 books on change management. He compares distributed leadership to sports, right? So we have probably watched watching TV recently, right? A lot of sports, a lot of games, a lot of soccer going on. Um, the performance is directly correlated to the degree to which the players collaborate, right? What would happen if we work that way? Again, the, the studies that have come out in the last 20 years are supporting this statement. And I will show you, we'll show you a couple of um, applications on what happened once we change to distributed leadership from a command and control. What happens when you have team self-organized around a purpose, when that purpose doesn't change, and when you allow the teams to provide their own solutions to the customer challenges they face versus having someone tell them what to do, when to do it, or to do it by Wednesday, right? So what is the role then for leaders and managers in such distributed management and distributed leadership organizations? Our role is to actually work together to continuously improve processes and to support the people doing the work to provide the things necessary in order to deliver the services we expect. Yeah. So I have a question for you. How many of you actually feel engaged with your workplace, well, or you go to work as a uh, just to get a you know monthly salary. So, I, are you engaged, or you don't care about work? Cioè, si è, quanto ci sentite per la vostra azienda? Cioè, ci se, sentite molto per la vostra azienda, oppure lo vedete come un uh, andare a lavoro o perché si deve fare quindi ci tenete ma io ci tengo io mi diverto a lavorare I have fun I want to have fun at work so this guy here is Douglas McGregor he started to talk about this stuff in the 50s okay but yet we still you know, things haven't changed so, so much, unfortunately. He coined two terms, Theory X and Theory Y organizations. Are you aware, who, who knows about Theory X and Theory Y organizations? Okay, just me and Greg. Okay, good. So I'll slow, I mean, briefly. In this book, The Human Side of, of Enterprise, well, he was talking about these two uh, ways to organize uh, an enterprise. So the, the theory X is based on the assumption that individuals are lazy, they are passive, they are not motivated or engaged with the company. So managers, as Dragos was saying before, use the carrot and stick approach. So they actually set the tempo, they micromanage everyone, they say what to do everyone. So this is applicable in uh, routine work, but in creative and innovative work, I don't know how much applicable that is, but it's actually the very common practice still. So the command and control is characterized by a vertical structure with a lot of hierarchy and a top-down approach of decisions. So every employee is seen as a, ch as a choiceless doer, as Roger Martin said. It's, so you have no choice, you just do what you've been told by your managers. 
In contrapositions, uh, in contraposition, there's the theory why enterprise that is based on the assumption that individuals are actually adaptable, they are motivated, they are responsible. So they want to feel engaged with your company. So in the 50s, we were talking about this. Yet theory, theory X is still diffused. I do a lot of consulting and I see a lot of Theory X organizations still. So in a Theory Y environment, managers are there, as Vinet Naya was saying, to enable people to arrange organizational conditions that foster self-organization self and self-control, so distributed leadership. You know, the intrinsic motivators that Dragos was, was men mentioning before. So everyone is not a choiceless doer anymore, but is both a chooser and a doer. That's why the human being is at, is at its core, and we talk, we refer to them as human enterprises. So a human enterprise is, is a living system. So. The organization is, a is like a living system because it's based on human beings. And the, I mean, the, the main principle is that frontline employees, so the ones that have, uh, the, they are in touch with customers for most of the time. They make strategic decision every time they talk to a customer. So st strategy is not imposed from the top but it's actually uh, decided um, on the fringe. So this is a fantastic, I think, principle, but yet again, it's not new. It's from the 50s. So in a human enterprise, employees are put first. So before, the, the, the goals come before the ones of the company, because if we do the good for the employees, the company will benefit. But how come only 20% of uh, employees declare to be highly engaged in their organization? Well, I've asked myself this several times, but of course it, it's not an easy thing, obviously. Um, it's mainly due to, uh, I think, a leadership um, matter. So we need leaders that uh, believe in this uh, mind mindset. So, especially in a world in, a, in an IT world, a knowledge work world, where we always face new problems all the time. So vola where volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and paradox are, are there, we need leaders. Routine work, we need managers. But we don't do routine work, so we, we need good leaders. And that's probably, I think, one of the reasons, you know, why this is not easy. Yeah, and, and one of the things when we talk about distributed leadership, we don't mean that we need to have more leaders that are distributed throughout the organization. It means that the acts of leadership are distributed through the organization at all the levels of the people working in the organization. Uh, individuals and teams self-organize and they are empowered to make decisions based on the challenges they face. Exactly. So I've tried myself to answer to that question several times. Also, why isn't it easy? to have a human enterprise. And this is my personal take, my personal list of uh, concepts for a human enterprise. So I think uh, that without a shared purpose and a distributed strategy, there can't be a human enterprise. Without empowerment, without distributed leadership, there can't be a human enterprise. And so without systematic experimentation, I mean, we need to innovate. We need to try new things. We need to experiment. Because 
problems are new all the time. We need to improve ourselves and the company with us. So the organization learns as we learn. We need to communicate with, it, with each other, remove any barriers, have uh, open dialogue, uh, look for, uh, as I say, constructive dissent. So it's good to have different opinions as long as it, it is con constructive. Uh, foster feedback loops. So try and review things all the time and, and improve. Work in teams and rely on peer review rather than the manager or the leader that knows everything. You know, I have to wait for the leader to tell me if I did the wrong or the right thing. The peer review is the fastest and, and the, probably the best way to, to consolidate the distributed leadership uh, way of, of, of working. And then integrative, integrative thinking, but we'll, we'll see some of them. So I want to ask you, does, does your company have a strategic plan? So please raise your hand if you're given a strategic plan. So, okay. How many of you actually did contribute to that? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so. 10 people. Okay, how many of you actually share the purpose of the plan? So, everyone that participated, I see, but not, uh, not the other ones that didn't take part to the um, decision process. So, I, I, have, I mean, my personal view of a, of a plan is, is bad, and I don't want to talk about it here because I think when you have a plan, it's a snapshot, and we need to adapt all the time. So if we stick to the plan, yeah, we could stick to the plan and make the wrong decisions anyway, because the, the environment changes. We have boundaries that change all the time. So what is actually good is to have a strategy where everyone took part to it, that we can continuously change. Everyone can continuously change and adapt it. So it's a distributed strategy. So, and this shared purpose, so if we have a shared purpose, we can do the following step, which is empowerment. So em through empowerment, uh, we can delegate stuff, we can distribute work across the team and across the organization. So through empowerment, employees, frontline employees can make decisions, strategic decisions, without asking for permission. And I just want to quote this lady here. So Grace Hopper, she was actually the one that found the first bug. Well, the in definition, yeah. uh, the computers back when they were actually a whole room and uh, a crash happened. It was actually an, an actual bug that, uh, you know, a crawling bug that, that you know, yeah, caused the crash. It. So that's where the name software bugs or bugs come from. But she coined that term. Yeah. This quote is fantastic. I think it's, it's an inspiration for all of us. Well, at first she says that the shipping port is safe, so we are in our comfort zone. But that's not what a ship is for. A ship has to go you know, in the ocean. So it needs to explore. So go in the unknown, explore the unexplored. And this other one says, it, it's much easier to apologize than to ask for permission. So it's, it's like a way to unleash us and, and do strategy for, for our organization. So through empowerment, we understand that uh, value creation for a company and for everyone takes place at the interface between customers and employees. And we focus on customized experiences. And I quote Jess Humble, um, 
when he says that the purpose of an organization is to put managers and employees in the customer's shoes. So if we do this, we're always right. So you can, everyone can make a decision if we understand, if we try and put ourselves in the customer's shoes. But this is my favorite. It's called Integrative Thinking, again, from Roger Martin, and Double Loop Learning from Chris Arjaris. They are two management experts. And uh, integrative, integrative thinking is the ability to question assumptions uh, and consider alternatives, even opposing ones. So always keep opposing minds uh, so that you, you, are, you, you don't take it is, you don't make a decision immediately and jump to conclusions immediately. Immediately, you, you just consider alternatives. And uh, this is the double loop learning, which I will also talk about tomorrow morning in my presentation about migrating to Postgres in Italian. So we are, we are used to uh, take actions. So and uh, get results and analyze results and change actions. So we stick in this loop, it's a single loop. So we change our actions based on the results, hoping that we can change results. But we're always in the same frame of mind. The most difficult thing is to actually go one step ba back and think about the beliefs and the assumptions that drive our mind to take some actions which lead to re some results. This is called double loop learning. I mean, we examine the results and we try and change ourselves, which is the most difficult task. And if we change ourselves, we might take different actions. We can think of a quick example here. How many people are carrying a cell phone or the same, same manufacturer that we used maybe seven, eight years ago? Anybody has a Motorola phone? Okay. How, about, how many Nokia phones do we have here? Oh, no Nokia phones. How many people still use a Kodak camera or Kodak film for taking pictures? Where is Kodak? Where is Nokia? Were they able to adapt? Were they able to keep up with the pace of change in the 21st century? Blockbuster, yeah. all these companies. So a lot of it has to do with survivability. What do you learn? If your frame of mind, if your beliefs do not change, if you, don't, if you think you're invincible, you're likely bound to fail like these companies. Yeah, so basically, I want to focus on the human enterprise culture. I mean, it's a, it's a culture okay, that, that through open-mindedness, through agility, and having an informal and transparent environment and making everyone feel important, we can actually grow together as an organization. So, well, it's, it's actually this cooperative culture that allowed us to try and experiment Lean and Kanban and DevOps a few years ago. About four, four years ago, we started to adopt these principles. And um, so I would actually uh, like Dragos to you know, explain a bit, talk a bit about Kanban now. Well, I'm not a methodologist, and I, I don't write books, and I don't blog a whole lot. I consider myself more of a doer and more of a solution person, not necessarily a Kanban person or lean person or an agile coach, which I have all these titles uh, from my employer. But uh, something that we have learned along the way, and I personally get, I was privileged and lucky to experience, was working for companies. One of them has offices here in Milan and several offices in Italy. It's called Avanad. Anybody heard of Avanad? Same company around, yeah? I don't know how many people they employ now. Um, last, you know, they probably have close to 800, 1,000 people in Italy now. When I was working with them, we had about 400, and I came to Italy several times, came to Milan. 
And between 2009 and 2014, we won one of the best um, places to work in IT four times. We're in the top 100. We are actually in the top 10 a couple of times. In Italy, we won uh, one of the top employers in Italy. And we've had some of the highest rates of customer, in, of, um, sorry, of employee engagement, which also translated in some of the highest scores in employee satisfaction. But I'll tell you that it has not been like that forever. Um, I joined that company in 2006, and between 2006 and 2009, we had to work very hard because in 2006, when I joined the leadership team there in IT, people were running out the door, throwing their badges behind, and were very unhappy, very dissatisfied uh, with what formerly was a very direct command and control leadership. The problem was that the company was growing very fast. While growing very fast, they were not able to adapt to the growth, and the command and leadership, they kept doing what they knew, just command and control. That didn't scale. We put a completely different leadership style in place, and that's what led to these results. And they're still being reproduced, and, and the company is still growing very fast, and they still have very engaged um, employees and very happy customers, and that's the reason they grow very fast. I know that it's very difficult, and I've heard from some of you earlier in the workshop today, this is very difficult when you work for a small company. It's, it's different when you work with 10 people or 40 people or 50 people. And it's a lot co very common company size uh, here. I've worked with, with co companies or in companies that had 300,000 people, 150,000 people, 70,000 people. And it's, it's a completely, when command and control is not eliminated from this organization, they do very poorly. They do very poorly. You have a lot of employees who are dissatisfied. They're not happy to come to work. The company has very poor results. And it's one of the things that I, I feel privileged or lucky that I have worked for such companies. So we have seen these things work. Um, quite a few things that Gabriele mentioned here. He talked about continuous improvement. He talked about dialogue, feedback loops, teamwork, and peer reviews. He talked about double loop learning, um, building alternative beliefs, or being able to adapt your beliefs based on the situations that you face. So Kanban has evolved from all these needs. And what we realized was that Many of the challenges we've had in technology was the invisible nature of the work that I mentioned earlier. And in the workshop today, I mentioned, been talking about this for a while. Imagine if all the driving that you do, all the driving, all the moving around, either going to work or maybe you travel, you go on a vacation, what would happen if all of a sudden there is no light? You're still able to see, right? We still have our eyes, we still have our sight. But what happens if it's dark? What happens if you don't have headlights? Would you drive? Would everybody else drive? Probably not. You would probably wouldn't be sa feel safe to drive in, that, in those conditions. Yet, we choose to work like that. We choose to work in complete darkness, darkness and regardless, regardless of all the things we run and bump into and all the crashes we have, we keep going like there is no tomorrow, right? Uh, Kanban evolved from a very basic need to create visibility. And the way we called it is to turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. Let's see what is going on in the organization. Make everything transparent. How much work do I have in progress? And when we started to work in this case with this organization, they've had this, this, product, this uh, throughput rates. And you can't really see these numbers, but I'll tell you, they are about uh, 12 to, to, to 15 on average. 12 to 15 deliverables per week. And here is the same team getting close to 60. And this is within two months of putting something different in place. What was that different thing in place that we put? Very simply, we created a huge board. It had only these two top, top two lanes. It didn't have the bottom lane. And these were two teams in the whole organization. This is one of the top three software providers for point of sales machines that people use in fast food restaurants, right? You go to McDonald's, you likely using some of the, I mean, the people behind the cash machine, they use this software. So they have two different teams, right? Then they do about two to 15 things a week. And then within a short period of time, we create this visibility. What changed? How come, how can you improve productivity five times within two months? What were they doing before? Well, very simple. About 28 people have 200 to 400 things in progress. We reduce this to 24. This is less than one item per person. 
It's not all. We started to have meetings in front of these boards. This board reflects everything that's in progress. These are things that have not yet been started and people are trying to figure out what they need to do in order to build the things they are asked for. Then they choose and they prioritize the next things to work on. And then the engineering work starts from here until about here. How do they control how much work they have in progress? If you would count these tickets here, you'd see there's six tickets. You can only have six tickets in a row, and you can only have four rows. They can never have more than 24 tickets in this box. This team cannot have more than 24, but they found out that the sweet spot was a whole lot less, so they never go to a third row. They stick more is about 12. Something else that we did, despite showing that you cannot, you can barely get anything done when you have 400 things in progress for 28 people. Then uh, we started to see there are a lot of blockers represented by these pink uh, tickets or purple tickets in here. So whenever something is blocked and you cannot move it forward, you block it. And every day there's a stand-up meeting in front of this board. You will, uh, Gabriele will show you some of his stand-up meetings at the um, second quadrant. And these meetings have only one purpose. They're not status meetings. They're all focused about on what do we need to deliver and what is blocking those deliverables and how can we get that done. Instead of sending emails to each other, those problems are solved in front of this board. I've had such meetings with 20 to 40 people. And initially, when you get started, yes, these meetings are long and people are really annoyed and they don't like it. But once the teams start to gel and they start to work together, these meetings with 20 to 40 people take less than 15 minutes once you get a practice underway. Once these meetings get to 15 minutes, everybody goes back to their desks, and most of the days they don't need a whole lot more meetings to do, while before they were spending a lot of meetings. So um, to summarize what I have seen with, with hundreds of teams, I worked all over the world of all sorts of different sizes. What happens here, you have a lot of work in progress. Why? You keep starting work that you don't have enough information for. So you put it down, you start to send emails, maybe you have to provide a bunch of estimates, maybe you have to go into a lot of meetings to figure out who's going to do all this work, right? What happens when you reduce the amount of work in progress from 400 to 24? First of all, you have to have an agreement as a leadership team that they select and you have an agreement on what are the most important 24 things for the company. And once you figure out that this is your magic number, whatever that number is, you don't start anything unless you deliver. So for example, if you have 24 things in progress here and you delivered four today, you can start on four other things tomorrow, right? That's kind of how it works. So how do we get there? Uh, what are the magic things that we measure? They're very simple. We measure cycle times and lead times, which is the amount of work or the amount of time it takes to complete the work, we measure something else called flow efficiency. So as people who complete the work and work moves through this board, now this board can be JIRA, you know, you can do all this work in JIRA, these are just different statuses that work goes through. Sometimes you have your hands on something and you work on it, sometimes you have to block it, or you have to wait for someone to provide information, or you have to wait for a system admin to be available to, to, to complete a task before you can move the work forward. When we do a ratio between the work times and the wait times, we find something defined in lean um, as flow efficiency, right? A flow efficiency of 10% means that if it takes you 100 days to make, let's say, this deliverable, a flow efficiency of 10%, it means that the people doing the work touch it or drop it um, for about 10 days out of the 100. What happens for the other 90 days? He's putting it down because he doesn't have enough information. Maybe he has to work on something else, or maybe we give him an, uh, an expedite, or maybe we yell at him to start working on something else. So there's interruptions, there's changes in priorities. The bottom line is, we found out that flow efficiencies in, uh, in technology and IT organizations that struggle to deliver things is a single digit is between one and 9%, where one to five are not exceptions to the rule. The bigger the organization and the more work they have in progress, the less productive uh, they are and the least flow efficiency they have. So we look at the demand rate, so meaning what is the demand to this organization, let's say on a weekly basis, what is their delivery rate on the same weekly basis, and what are their cycle time distributions. So in here you see three different charts, or I'm sorry, three different lines on this chart 
one is for small, one is for medium, one is for large. We stop estimating and we use forecasts. If I have done 2,000 things in the last three years and I have data that tells me how big a small, a medium, and a large is, I don't need to estimate. These forecasts, based on past performance, include your flow efficiency or flow inefficiency, whatever you have. So then, um, what are the principles and practices of Kanban? There's nothing magic in, in these principles and practices. It's actually a lot of work. But the, what makes it different than uh, other methodologies, we start with what we currently do, which means we have to accept the current reality. How are we working now? What are we trying to improve? Maybe the customer or someone in a leadership role is complaining, saying that it takes you forever to get things done, it takes too long. What is too long? When I ask companies, they can say, it's just, it's too long. We want the team to produce more. How much more? Mm, we don't know, more. What they do now is not enough. How much do they produce now? Uh, we don't know. So if you cannot improve something, you, you are not measuring, right? That, that, that's not news. Uh, so we start with what you do now, we understand what we do, what our uh, delivery rates, what is our demand rate, we understand the flow efficiency, we create visibility that shows here is the work that comes in, here is how the work moves, here is where the work is blocked and why, then you will know what to do, you may, can make a choice. If I want to improve, what can I improve? Well, it's right there in front of you. How do we do all that? Uh, you show the example of the board, so we visualize everything, we make everything transparent, at some point, we start limiting the work in progress, but initially, remember, we're going to put all those 400 things we have in progress and understand why do we have so much and where should that go. Um, and the focus is on work, it's not on people. We're not looking at people and say, we have to make these people more productive, is we look at how much work we have and say, how can we make work travel as fast as possible from the moment it is requested to the moment it is delivered. And what we have learned is that we end up with all this work in progress because we don't have enough information, so we start with few things, we eliminate those patterns why we don't have information to complete the work, and magic happens. So um, it's been, David Anderson wrote a book in 2010, uh, all these principles and practices are explained in the book, but pretty much this is where Postgre started uh, four years ago. I'm sorry, second quadrant. Yeah, basically we, we, we started to introduce uh, lean, uh, I mean, we, we, we were born as an agile company and we started to introduce all these com concepts in 2012, 2000, oh sorry, yeah, thanks. We started to introduce these concepts in 2012 and uh, I'm, we started to introduce DevOps uh, which increased a lot communication and collaboration of a uh, of a team members, and the the most important result was that we started to think about system goals rather than silos goals. So rather than developers thinking of their own objectives and administrators doing the same, they were thinking of general and global global goals. Then they, they start, they, they, we invested in pair programming, in continuous experimentation and automation, repetition, uh, version control, things like that. But definitely Kanban was the practice that produced the most relevant uh, results. And uh, I would say also unpredictable, not only outstanding, but I'm pretty, I couldn't imagine that, for example, we could achieve shorter de delivery times in a very limited period, that we could achieve empowerment, self-organization, more collaboration, et cetera, lots of, lots of things. And uh, it, I, I, I found out about Kanban, but I didn't want to impose that on, on the team. But slowly, the team gradually felt the need to make the invisible visible. And uh, they, they decided to adopt Kanban. They set their own rules. And within second quadrant, we have, uh, you know, we, we think, we believe that everyone can change any rule if a better one 
uh, is, found, is found. So if you come and propose a better way to handle or a better process, we can change everything. The, the, the difference is that we talk about better practices, not about best practices. And, and I know we're, we're yeah. almost running, we're already running out of time. But I want to differentiate between best practices versus better practices and ties this back to what we said in the beginning about command and control leadership from the industrial revolution and distributed leadership that works better in knowledge and creative work. If you think about it, repetitive work, repetitive tasks were meant for simple systems which are defined as systems where boundaries do not change. If the boundaries change, you come up with a different set of, of best practices. So best practices and standard operating procedures work for what is known as simple or maybe complicated systems where boundaries of the system do not change as you interact with the system. However, that's not where we operate most of the times. Many times we do. Maybe a tier one organization is an example where best practices and standard operating procedures would work very well not a product development organization. A product development organization lives in the world of complexity, which is defined as the boundaries of complex systems change as you interact with a system. We are complex systems. We're not wearing the same shoes as we are wearing when we were two years old or four years old or six years old. Our systems are the same way. They, they, they evolve and they change as we yeah, interact yeah. with them. Yeah. And we have, we have to adapt in response to that. So if complex systems, change boundaries, what can we use instead of best practices and standard operating procedures? The only way to find out is to experiment and monitor patterns. So experimentation is not possible in a command and control organization where you're afraid of failure or you are going to be punished if you're not doing what you are told. The people who are at the top of a command and control organization do not know how those systems perform and behave uh, in the realm of complexity. And that's why you need to decentralize the decision yeah. making. Yeah, for example, I mean, at the beginning it was just a few of us, so my impact in technical decisions was higher, whereas now it's almost uh, now. I'm speaking of databases. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, here is a Kanban board. Our, actually, this is a stand-up meeting. Can you point out something from this picture? Hmm? What? We don't do any kind of... Oh, it's already, it's already been done. <laughs> Who is running the meeting? Yeah. Can it, Where's the manager there? That's cool. I didn't know that it was there. <laughs> you? You're good, Francesco. You're good. And yeah, there's nobody um, leading the, the board. Actually, I should say that everyone's leading it. So there's no manager saying, sitting in front directing everyone so saying, oh, we should do Why, we should ask maybe Francesco is there. What's the conversation? Yeah, from which... So there's open dialogue, everyone participates. We usually start from the rightmost end because we want to focus on finishing first. And as you can see, this is a good example because we haven't started something yet because first we want to finish what we have. So also we have post-its, as you can see, with different colors, uh, meaning different types of activities. We limit the work using magnets. And do you want to add something? Okay. So before Kanban, the average delivery time based on you know, the metrics we had in Redmine was three weeks. And uh, in the last year, we have reduced this to six days for development, six days for marketing and administration, because also marketing and administration uses Kanban. Seven days for operations and 15 days for 24-7 support. 
And as you can see, it's, I think it's a, good, it's a good result because it's also influenced, there's a lot of impact by, as Dragos was saying before, the waiting for a customer's um, verification. So we, most of the time it's, it's there waiting for the customer to say, yeah, it, it works for me. Maybe it's sitting. You're saying that out of 15 days, it takes you maybe less than five days to do the work, but the other 10 days is all yeah. these wait times for the customers. Yeah. yeah. And uh, globally, it takes eight days in general to, to, for uh, an activity to, to finish for us. So what, what happened there? Well, this is an interesting uh, event. Last year, in, I mean, last summer, in July, we decided to invest in a continuous integration uh, system. So it's an intangible investment that produced intangible benefits. What well, tangible benefits, but through intangible investment. So as you can see, the, the number of tickets delivered per week in the development department is, is going up. The trend is, is to go up. And this is the, the, the average weekly delivery time. So how long uh, the average uh, delivery time for all the tickets, tickets that have been delivered in a week. As you can see, there's a short-term impact that raises the average uh, delivery time per week. And then you see a dramatic reduction of the um, delivery time because thanks to continuous integration, we have been able to deliver faster, deliver more and deliver faster. Deliver more, you see the, the increase in delivery. And this is the, the work in progress in our uh, organization. As you can see, it's quite steady. We try and keep it under control. So in the dev department, we, on average, it is about six items per week, as you could see in the board before. So I think we've come to, to an end. And uh, yeah, as concluding points, I would like to focus on, on, on us, on human beings that like to work in a happy and motivated environment. So it is important to have fun. It is important to enjoy what we do because uh, we can be innovative. And uh, especially in, a, in the open source sector, the one that we work in with uh, a lot of competition and um, we have to think globally in the, in the, in the sense of you know, the world. So that's what I love of Postgres, for example, the Postgres community, the Postgres project, and the business I, I, I work for. So we, in our organization, we all have a shared purpose. We try and empower everyone uh, through distributed leadership, and we trust each other. It's, it's through this sincere trust that we can have open dialogue, we can uh, hold opposing ideas at the same time and we have we can produce better quality services and products so these are for me the building blocks of a human enterprise and uh, yeah. Dragos? yeah i think we we can take some questions if you have maybe we can pass this microphone around uh, i don't know if we need to do that um i just want to say i was thinking how I was working at Microsoft in 2004 when I started to work with this team that led to the creation of the Kanban movement. And I'll tell you, I was working 10 to 12 hours a day, and constantly I would be on the phone with distributed teams telling them what to do. And it seemed like I had to tell everybody what to do all the time. Within six months to eight months, which by the way, we reduced our delivery times from five months to three weeks, from five months to three weeks in one year. Same people doing the same type of work, five months to three weeks. These results have been replicated worldwide. Productivity rate 
went from nine, nine deliverables from the team per quarter to close to 45, and then we hired another developer and test, test and we went to 60. So these were very remarkable results. But I will tell you that once we were six to, to eight months working in a different way, I was not telling anybody what to do. We call this pull. This is also in lean language, they talk about pull. What is the next job we need to pull? Who was making the pull decisions? The team. How? We were making clear what's the most important thing for the company, and they were organizing based on skills. Maybe Gabriela is working on something, and maybe my work is done. So I'm looking to pull something from the left. However, I am not a specialist in this work that's next in order to be done and is most urgent. Maybe I have a conversation with Gabriele and say, Gabriele, I can take over and finish what you have because you are a specialist and you can take this new piece of work. So these are the conversations that the teams started to have without me, without the manager telling them what to do. And there are a lot of other things. So we don't, uh, we don't uh, pretend that we, are, we have taught you anything. We just want to make you curious about exploring ways that can make you more productive, more engaged, which would make your customers and your leadership teams happier as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, do we have uh, audience questions here on stage? Valentin? So you mentioned uh, that you can actually measure the performance of the teams. So I can imagine that it's uh, actually measurement of the performance and throughput of uh, um, items is doable uh, inside one team. How do you calibrate between the teams? Because the, the weights are kind of b bound to the team itself. They, it's not company-wide. It's very interesting what you say about measuring the teams or the delivery of the teams. We actually chose to switch the language. And as I said, um, Kanban and Lean and Agility is not necessarily, it's not about people. We don't look at people, we look at work. So how can we measure the throughput of work that may come from one team or another, right? So we measure the throughput. So we go, for example, if you go into Jira, you have all the, let's say you have an organization, maybe you have a thousand people. They are on different teams, but everything they do is recorded in Jira, right? If you go and you somehow look at all the things that have been delivered per month, per quarter, per year, whatever, right? And you categorize that by your teams. See, you see what they have delivered by month, by year, but you also have to categorize it. Apples to apples, watermelons to watermelons, bicycles to bicycles. Pretty much that tells you what the capacity of the team is. The capacity of the team is what have they delivered in the past, they're very likely to deliver at the same rate in the future. Now, that's one thing to understand. The other one is why do watermelons take this time, apples this time, and bicycles this time, and what, uh, what is the flow efficiency for building those things? And those are the opportunities for improvement. Yeah, so uh, you say that uh, if, but how, how do you, so you have two apples that are produced by two mm -hmm. teams. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, how can you measure that this apple is as good as another apple? So, uh, or how can you, me how you, can you actually compare an apple and a pear? They both are tasty, they both are more or less the same size, but they're different um, and, and have different impact on the, right. because I, my business is selling apples and not pears and uh, they cost different. So, so are you saying that you don't want to produce pears, pears, but sometimes you end up with pears even though you want apples? So it's a, is it a quality issue or? Anyway, so we, de we define the deliverables. We actually define what are, what are our services, what are our deliverables, right? And um, we track quality issues as well. So if we have quality issues, we focus, we track them. Yeah. It's, it's the quality issues are bugs and blockers that are being tracked. I think I, think I have now a better uh, um, example. So you mentioned that you are using Kanban for marketing and for development. So, uh, and then kind of you, 
produce work in marketing and you produce work in development. And the question is, there is a question, what, what is the impact of the work that done by, uh, it's kind of through, so work marketing job kind of thingies and development thingies, how to uh, measure, if we want to measure the impact on the organization of this work, is it possible uh, or? Absolutely. It, it, it depends if you see a relationship between, for example, let's say we have a deliverable, you want to put a new service on the market. We're building a new product. This new product involves engineers building the product and involves sales and marketing and maybe other groups and maybe we use Kanban across all groups. But it's just like in Scrum, the way you have, you have epics and you have user stories and then you see the flow efficiency of those user stories and their cycle times in different parts of the organization. What we optimize, we don't optimize for flow for one team in the middle of the organization. The right way to, and sometimes that's where you start. But the right way to do it is to look at flow across what we call the whole value stream. And marketing is unlikely that they are blocking you or they're creating huge delays in the release of, of, of your product. But sometimes it may be possible that they are, but you're able to see it. And you're able to see what is the slowest link or what is the bottleneck in your system. But we are, we are measuring, we are categorizing, if, and sometimes they're not related. Let's say we want to put this product on the market, but here is my marketing team that may work on five or six other things, like organizing a conference and doing other things that have nothing to do with the product. Those tickets would have a different color, they would be categorized differently, and likely they have a different priority. So we know what we have to focus on. The other interesting part is that the conference has fixed dates. Other deliverables may not have fixed dates. So we get into the technicality where we have, we have a way of establishing all these different, we call them classes of service, we call them risk levels. Um, it's a whole, it's, it's actually, it's, it's uh, I, I, the short answer is that we do, we track, and we're able to compare and understand how each part of the organization is affecting the other parts. And we're looking for the whole. We don't try to, again, tailorism and the, all these um, approaches to management in the Industrial Revolution had to do with what? Command and control was based on tailorism, which said the job of the manager is to take a job, evaluate it, analyze it, break it down into tasks, and have specialists who are very efficient, like clogs in a, clogs in a machine, they're very efficient to turn things down. The cogs don't make the decision, the manager does. And they have a carrot and stick, you know, you make 10 things, you get $10 or 10 euros, you make five, you're fired. But uh, we don't use tailorism, we don't use that approach. And then, I mean, it, it's quite informal. It's not that we, we have to uh, abide, the, I mean, the, the, the rules all the time. I mean, we, we, you own the rules. we own the rules, so we decide, I mean, we can be, Strict, not strict, it depends. We examine that on a case uh, basis. And for example, here we have a phase which is user acceptance. So for example, we wait, we produce something for the customer, so it is the customer that says, that's fine with me. So it's the customer itself that participates through the process. It's actually the last step before we consider a task finished for example. So, uh, and then we could measure the number of bugs we open and things like that. Okay, so <laughs> I think another applause is in order. Thank you.